Magazine, a cornerstone of the nuclear family domestic fantasy where men were men and women were expected to be a slave in the kitchen. Magazines like Good Housekeeping perpetuated the notion that a woman's place was in the home and they were taught to knit and stay fit. Then came rock and roll. Following on from the tradition of Spare Rib, a British feminist magazine that emerged from the counterculture of the 1960s, a new generation of writers have turned to the internet to further the dialogue and push forth the activism. No prizes for how Spare Rib got its name, a biblical reference to the first woman, Eve, being formed of the rib of the first man, Adam. It was one of the first publications to explore alternatives to traditional gender roles of women as supplements to men. It featured articles like What's the Revolution Done for Women in Cuba and On the Boss's Lap for Christmas, Back Under His Thumb for Next Year. It debunked the idea that women must either be virgins, wives or mothers and investigated issues like fiscal inequality and the exploitation of women as consumers through fashion or household goods and openly questioned the notion of women as object. We look at three of the more clickable sites, the F word, Jezebel and feministing and touch on other movements like Daughters of Eve and the Everyday Sexism Project. Fast forward to the 21st century and the age of the internet. Increased connectivity doesn't always mean increased equality. Although the forums for progressive dialogue have expanded, the internet has also spawned new ways of bullying. Internet trolling through social media and the start of chat rooms dedicated to the pickup artist, or men who swap tales and techniques of picking up women and using them for sex, further muddy a struggle whose battles are already fought on numerous sides. First up is the F word. This blog has turned into a go-to site to discuss feminist issues and is used as a forum to bring in more gendered perspectives on current affairs. Its homepage features issue-based articles such as Why Should We Fight to Get Rid of Page 3? and reviews of cultural events such as Don't Be Afraid of Vagina Wolf, an all-female variation on the original Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf film. It got its name by playing the notion that feminism is a dirty word. Run as a collective, it features no advertising and is a labor of love for all involved. Writers aren't paid, but their work is seen as a donation to the movement as a whole. Founded to feature the kinds of stories the writers would like to read about, they include an events section to further underline the activism implied by its existence. Debunking Oprah-style cookie-cutter feminism, articles like The Silent Strong Woman question the fetishization of exceptional female achievement. What I mean by that is, hey, check out this woman engineer or this woman scientist. The argument is for gender equality, so there shouldn't be anything particularly special about women taking on particular roles, and vice versa. Furthermore, female role models and images of women are brought into question. The article features a letter by a young girl to the toy company, Lego, asking for more girl people because if you hadn't noticed, there aren't that many girl people in Lego boxes. The article quite rightly pointed out that despite the illusion that we'd be more likely to see a boy person walking around with a hammer, Charlotte hit the nail on the head. And to add insult to injury, Lego also offer a princess fairyland option to their standard building blocks repertoire, because all girls want to be princess fairies and play in pink, right? Hot on its emancipated heels is feministing a blog founded in 2004 by writer Jessica Valenti. Feministing is an American site which covers mainstream stories such as cuts to uninsured working adults under Obamacare, but the stories have a particular focus on what this actually means for women. She felt that young feminists were being excluded from the feminist conversation. Her audience and writers were men and women whose lives predated parenthood and included those who chose to live child-free lives. In an article called The Child-Free vs. Breeder War, Why We Are Fighting It, the author tables arguments about the psychological profiling of people on both sides of that divide. Here the use of the word breeder in the title serves as a lure to potential readers. It's assumed you've either used the word as an insult or are insulted by the word. It then takes out a list of preconceptions both parties have about the other. Its style is discursive and engaging, and, as with most articles on the site, the reader comments at the bottom of the article highlight the controversy quoted by the piece. As with other sites, shorter pieces are shared more often, like the one featuring Kai Bogert. His parents issued a retraction of his birth announcement in 1995 as a girl in their local paper in a show of support for their son's gender transition. 
His mother said that when Kai told her that he no longer wanted to live as a girl, she felt she needed to show my son I support him 100% and wanted to let the world know that. Because Valenti started the blog as a way to get young voices heard, she stepped down in Logan's Run style when she hit her early 30s, saying it was time for her to step back and allow some younger feminists to turn. Lastly is Jezebel, the 921st most popular website according to Alexa. They do internet ratings. Not most popular feminist website. Website. Owned by Gawker, that American behemoth of snark and sarcasm, it purports to push content for Gawker's female readers. Hello, pink clickbait. Another publication that says they're making the kind of women's magazine they'd want to read, Jezebel's Manifesto says it will, quote, attempt to take all the essentially meaningless but sweet stuff directed our way and give it a little more meaning while taking more of the serious stuff and making it more fun or more personal, at the very least the subject of our highly sophisticated brand of sex joke. An example of this is a piece on the Bic Biro for women, Bic for her. Taken from a user submission of a photograph at a local stationery store, the reader writes, Oh, thank the heavens above, my feeble female hands were just a-struggling with those bulky man pens. The article goes on to say that the pen manufacturer's refusal to make a product that accommodates our inability to use anything that's not cute is nothing short of discrimination. But thankfully, Bic has listened to our many complaint letters, which of course we dictated to men. The short but highly clickable piece further goes for the jugular with, hopefully, Bic will release a version that writes in pink. It makes all the hearts above our eyes look so much better. Not beyond criticism, Jezebel was slated by Slate for, quote, ginning up page views by exploiting women's worst tendencies. It states, It's a prime example of the feminist blogosphere's tendency to tap into the market force of what I've come to think of as outrage world, the regularly occurring firestorms stirred up on mainstream, for-profit, woman-targeted blogs like Jezebel, and that they're ignited by writers who are pushing readers to feel what the writers claim is righteously indignant rage, but which is actually just petty jealousy, cleverly marketed as feminism. It accuses Jezebel of creating the same ego wounds women's glossy magazines do when they write articles like Is He Into You? or How To Please Him? by roping in clickbait techniques to get women outraged and, more importantly, sharing the pieces on the internet. So by posting weight loss tips and photos of impossibly thin models like a traditional women's magazine, Jezebel and The Slate and Salon, lady blogs, post a critique of a rail-thin model's physique explaining how her attractiveness hurts women, then the end result is the same as the old formula, women's insecurities sell ads. The only difference is the level of doublespeak and manipulation that it takes to produce that result. It's also been criticized at times um, as possibly exacerbating the race and class divide within the feminist movement. As aggregators for content focusing on gender issues, the sites we've discussed can help raise awareness behind feminist struggles. However, more specific sites prove just as popular and powerful ways of making a point. Hashtag Feminism is a site that collates the most popular feminist and gender-based topics on the internet by scraping hashtags off social media. The user can click on a particular hashtag like Yes All Women and be taken into an analysis, a comment, and a history behind that particular trend. It can tell you things such as the top feminist hashtags of 2014, for instance, which turned out to be All Men Can, Bring Back Our Girls, and Dudes Greeting Dudes. It also offers statistics on the number of prominent articles written about these hashtags and in which publication. It's a great tool for finding out what the hell everyone's tweeting about. The Everyday Sexism Project exists to catalogue instances of sexism experienced by women on a day-to-day -day basis. So, submissions are by users and readers. Their daily observations and experiences of sexism. Spoken in a voice of whoever's writing it, it's a powerful tool for those who feel that their voices are not being heard and, sometimes, for those who would normally be too scared to speak out. Daughters of Eve is a site that talks about the elephant in the room, or at least one of them, female genital mutilation, or FGM. They want to advance and protect the physical, mental, sexual, and reproductive health rights of young people from FGM practicing communities. It's not a blog. It doesn't feature arguments or opinions. It doesn't go for clickbait. 
It lays out the facts behind a practice that, for one reason or another, no one seems all too comfortable talking about. And it offers a virtual shoulder to lean on for women who are affected by this dangerous barbarism. It's possibly one of the best examples of the potential of the internet to do good. In the era of hashtag activism, where a social movement can be boiled down, quantified, and trivialized by SEO rankings, trending keywords, and social media shares, having a thing to do IRL in real life becomes more and more important. Websites and blogs are key. The F word, feministing, and Jezebel all serve as platforms for important dialogue but it would be good to remember that their political purpose wouldn't exist without there being conventional women's magazines still out there that peddle aspirations that perpetuate gender inequality. Women are still being sold great new egg whisks and things in pink. What is more fundamental is that the click holes these alternatives and these alternative sites take you down spur you towards action.